we're going to be doing, or for today, rather, we're going to be doing propensity scores. So um, this week, we're really going to touch on two things that are somewhat disjoint um, in the context of thinking about experimental design and, and more generally just thinking about um, I think the way to think about this is I'm trying to give a little more structure for thinking about um, broader empirical challenges that are going to come up. So propensity scores is going to give us a really good, it sounds kind of obvious. And I, I think for those of you who've seen this, this is going to be kind of a methods thing that'll um, maybe not seem that advanced, but what's really useful about this is it will give us a lot of structure for thinking about instrumental variables and other research designs later. And then the other is we're going to be thinking about interference and violations of sattva. So if you remember, we were talking about um, stable unit treatment value assignment. That's what sattva stands for. If you say it enough times, you'll remember. Um, and um, let me actually move this over so that I can see the chat. Um, and really more generally, we're going to be talking about the idea of interference and dynamics. So these are all just sort of the interesting aspects of treatment assignment that we don't really allow for in the current setting that are of obvious interest to economists. And so we're going to touch on those um, on Thursday. And they may come up again, but hopefully this will give you kind of the basic structure for thinking about those problems. So today, the goal, we're going to work on propensity scores. And the goal um, for the end day is so we're going to talk about propensity scores and kind of their general setting in the literature. Really what I want you all to come away with today, by the end of today, is to have a structure for thinking about what does the propensity score kind of reflect um, in terms of when we think about conditioning on observables and estimating treatment effects. And more generally, like, there's this very nice literature um, that kind of thinks about the underlying economic model that would motivate a propensity score and kind of who that's reflecting. This is, this is kind of Heckman's big view on this is that you, if you think about things in terms of a Roy model, you can kind of um, map propensity scores into this literature. And so this is going to give us a lot of structure. Um, that's where we want to end up by the end of today. So let's get started. Any questions on that so far before I, I get moving? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so this week, oh, I already said this. Okay, so we... Um, we have kind of two results from the previous, uh, from last week that are, I want to kind of highlight and reemphasize again. So one of them was this thing I called the Horvitz-Thompson estimator. And this traditionally comes from just like the sampling literature, the survey literature. Um, and we're going to talk about it again um, shortly, but just as a re reminder, it's this idea that we reweight observations by their propensity that they were going to be treated um, when trying to calculate the average um, treatment value for something. Basically, the point being that when you want to impute missing data, you kind of want to upweight it as a function um, of, or downweight it as a function of how likely it was to be treated. So that's what these things do, right? So, you know, the smaller the probability is and you see it treated, you kind of upweight that value um, and vice versa, because this is one over the probability of being treated. So if that probability is very small, you'd upweight that and vice versa. Um, the second result, remember, just was the strong ignorability condition, which was the idea that DI is strongly ignorable conditional on a vector X if this statement was true, conditional on this vector X that the treatment assignments are orthogonal to DI. And then there's this second piece, which is about the propensity score um, being bounded away from zero and one. So this you know, probability of DI equals one, I'm gonna to refer to it as pi. I may lose the thread and I've occasionally put a P, but I, I'm trying to put it as pi um, throughout everything. This is the propensity score. So you may or may not have seen this before um, in a number of different settings. We're gonna focus on this particular object today, which intuitively is kind of just a, a simple measure, right? It's, it's an indicator function. It could be, we can make it more complicated. It doesn't, DI doesn't have to be an indicator for this to be useful, but it's just a probability function conditional on a bunch of covariates where XI here can be high dimensional. And this is what we're gonna focus on. So why does the propensity score matter? So this is a very famous paper by um, Rosenbaum and Rubin. So this is Rubin of the, the Rubin causal model, who kind of points out like, 
okay, well, a lot of times in our strong ignorability condition, you know, we have to condition on XI, which we think of as being quite high dimensional. And the result that um, Rosenbaum and Rubin show is that if you have strong ignorability conditional on XI, you can condition on the propensity score, this pi, whatever the output, this scalar pi, and it will also be true that the y, the, your potential outcomes will be orthogonal to your di. Another way of saying this is that conditional on pi x, you know, of pi of x, that the distribution of the x size is identical. It, no matter if you're treated or untreated. So it basically creates balance automatically between the two of these. So this is, you know, this is basically where the logic comes from is that by conditioning on this, this pi of X, which um, is essentially the, the measure that collapses down this high dimensional um, X I variable into a single dimension, that that is sufficient to generate strong ignorability. So that may seem like, so what? But it's pretty powerful, right? Like in the sense that you've converted what is potentially a number of things, right? So we could think about all the X's that are necessary. It could be age, education, um, historical income, race, ethnicity, et cetera. And now what we said is, well, all we have to do is construct a propensity score about whether or not you're treated and that's sufficient. And that's, that's pretty remarkable, especially in the context in which, you know, historically, this idea of being able to use many, many covariates on the right hand side was a lot more challenging. So, you know, this, this starts to be a little more complicated. So just to give you kind of a concrete example uh, of what does this mean? Well, conceptually, actually, before we jump into that, let me just quickly show you what that would mean, right? So what does that mean empirically that's going on? Well, what you would do if you are, um, excuse me, if you're thinking about the, where's my video thing? Here we go. If you're thinking about the, if you're thinking about the identification statement of what you wanna get, remember that what we were interested in is E of tau I. This was our average treatment effect that we wanted. Well, conceptually what, we ended up saying the reason we were able to do this is what we used was the law of iterated expectations. We said, okay, well, we can estimate this. Um, we know that we can estimate this conditional on XI and that this is just the underlying conditional average treatment effect that we can estimate. So what this statement Set, lets us do this Rosenbaum and Rubin result says is well all you have to really do so remember this outside expectation is taken with respect to the xi all you really have to do is you can just take the difference in these two outcomes conditional on this pi of x so another way of saying this is we just need to find all the people who have the same propensity score and take their differences and then average that up over this pi distribution so that's very powerful and, and, and created a number of potential benefits in the sense that it sort of simplified the problem significantly. So just to give you a concrete example of what I mean, um, one second. So um, to give you a concrete example, um, in the context of um, Rosenbaum and Rubin, they had in mind the idea that, well, what could be happening is that you're a medical practitioner and you have a bunch of treated individuals and you want to find people who look like those treated individuals, you know, out of a large control sample. When you have many, many covariates that you're worried about potentially conditioning on for this. And so given that high dimensionality, how do you think about drawing that person? You would obviously like to match them perfectly, but that can be quite challenging. And so what this result suggested was, oh, well, I just fit a propensity score model. I construct one. And then I say, well, given that, I need to just find someone who looks similar on this pie. So that's one, you know, one example of why that can be useful. There's a number of other ones. But what this does now, and we'll come back to this idea, is that this actually starts to just open up new concerns you have to worry about. And so you want to condition ideally on this propensity score exactly, right? 
And so it's actually very challenging to do that, to find exact matches. So this is what's called matching. So this is matching with propensity scores. And effectively, you know, it's challenging um, to do this. So this is from Rosenbaum and Rubin, this quote. Unfortunately, exact matches, even on scalar balancing score, are all often um, impossible to obtain. So methods which cr seek approximate matches must be used. So this is sometimes referred to as caliper matching or nearest neighbor matching. Um, half this class is just going to be like, what is the terminology that people use to describe these things? Because unfortunately, it's just a huge number of different things. So when people describe nearest neighbor matching or K nearest neighbor matching in the context of propensity scores, what they're saying is, okay, so let's take this unit one. I want to match this person with a um, pi, uh, the propensity score equal to 0.33. To whom do I match them to that is treated or excuse me, untreated? Well, the closest person is this unit two. And so there's a, this is gonna be the closest uh, match I can find. That's doing nearest neighbor. The other version you could do is you could do, set a caliper when you have more data. And a caliper, for those who don't know, is like this thing that you can use to measure um, the sizes that looks, looks like this. Um, so you, you'd vary the size and you'd say it only within some margin. So you'd say, I only wanna take propensity scores within 0 0.01. And so ideally you'd have a bigger sample and you'd say, okay, I'm only gonna take those matches. So these are different ways that can do this. The kind of the thing to highlight that I just, the point that I wanna highlight for, for you all is to say, well, as I start to match these things, it, be, it becomes obvious where the, the problems are, right? So if I do nearest neighbor matching and I wanna construct these conditional values um, on condition on a given pi, uh, pi of X, how do I do it and who should I pick? So in that example I gave you where we're matching one and two together, they're quite um, they're quite far away from one another. It wasn't obvious why for unit two, you should pick unit one, given especially that unit four is also really close, right? So kind of the example in this case, we had unit one and unit two, 0 0.33, 0 0.14, they were the closest, so we matched them. Well, unit four was only a little bit further away. Why wouldn't I also use that one for unit two as their match? And so this matching way of doing things can create issues and can frankly create some serious inference problems as well. So um, Alberto Abadi and Hito Imbens have a paper in Econometrica talking about this. There's basically bootstrapping in this setting. This is called, in the sampling literature, is called hot deck imputation. So what this does is essentially create an issue in which you're resampling either with or without replacement from these samples to find matches. And that can create weird statistical inference issues. So this is, this is solvable, but matching can create problems. So all this is to say is to say that depending on how you impute stuff is going to create potentially some wonky issues. So that, that's matching when we're thinking about this explicitly. So what I kind of want to emphasize to you all is that, well, remember, when we were thinking about matching in this way, matching is, a, is taking the problem very literally, right? So remember when we went back to here, we said, look, all we have to do is condition on this and then we can find these are going to be orthogonal to one another. So let's just condition on that value and, and match as best we can within those categories. Um, however, in a lot of cases, you don't care about the inside piece, right? This, you don't really need to know the inside conditional expectation function. Like, the value of the treatment effect for pi equals 0.33 is not something you care about. Really what you care about is some average over some subpopulation. So here we're doing the average treatment effect. So we care over the whole sample, but it could be, you know, 50% of the sample or so, some average over this distribution. And kind of the key result is that if you use this Horvitz Thompson estimator, which also gets called the inverse probability weighting estimator, these, you can use the propensity scores and const without having to kind of match between the two of them. What you're doing is you're just reweighting observations in order to get a better approximation to the underlying distribution. So if you recall, when we were doing work with the um, design-based inference, this 
um, Horvitz Thompson estimator came up because this was like this idea of, well, when you have random sampling, like I'm just coin flipping amongst all of you, that you get even distributions across this. What the inverse probability weighting is dealing with is the fact that some people are just much more likely to get treated than others. And so this is dealing with those facts that we're kind of gonna get a lot of them otherwise. To make this really concrete, kind of imagine that this was this X was discrete and it was something like, um, you know, education. Well, if high edu like highly educated folks are much more likely to take on a treatment than less educated folks, but what we care about is kind of the effect over the whole population, if we don't reweight as a function of this, we're going to overestimate the effect of a treatment, right? So it's it's very, I mean, this is a this is just a confounder, right? It's this idea of what we're doing is we need to condition on X in order to upweight the fact that some people are going to be much more treated um, than others. And what's nice about this is that it it really works independent of what X is like. If X was discrete, right, this would be a, a straightforward problem. We could just plug in with averages. This is not this is not very complicated. When things are continuous, it becomes more complicated. But this is effectively a very straightforward exercise that lets us calculate the underlying potential outcomes um, directly. Any questions on that? Hopefully that's at least somewhat clear what's going on. This is kind of, this approach is pretty intuitive and you should really think of it as, you know, if we take, remember that expectations are linear. So really what we're doing is we're, we're finding an estimator for one potential outcome and then we're finding an estimator for the other potential outcome. And then we can just take the difference between the two. Okay, great. So, um, this is just, uh, it's kind of a fact worth noting. It sort of shows up less in the econ literature, but there's really no reason for it not to. Um, if you think about the inverse propensity score weighting estimator, um, this estimator is effectively a little high variance with small samples. So in the smaller samples, um, what'll happen if you think about this, right, is you'll get really large or really small values of pi that can juice up uh, your denominator a lot and may cause there to be too much weight that's put on one thing over the other. And what you can use instead is what's called the stabilized um, inverse propensity score weighting estimator, which is by um, Hayek. And what it does is it just reweights the estimates as a function of kind of where the, um, where in the probability distribution they're coming from. So in the limit, this converges to the IPW. I mean, it's the same exercise, but what it's doing is it's constructing these WIs, which are the DI over, it's basically reweighting them by the overall average in the sample, right? So what is using is the fact from the data that we should basically adjust for getting really extreme draws one way or the other. In the limit, this W just converges to one, right? This is the expectation of this. The expectation of WI is always just one. Okay, so any questions so far? How many of you have seen propensity scores? I guess you should have a way of being able to just like raise your hand if you have seen a propensity score, either virtually or physically raise your hand. Okay. So, okay. So a good number of you have seen it. Okay. How many of you have actually used it in any sort of estimation? Okay. Less hands now. More. Okay. More. Less hands. I would say less. Okay. And that's pretty common, I think, in a con an econ space. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So next point to kind of emphasize about propensity scores is that propensity scores are, are kind of rarely known. The true propensity score is rarely known, right? So you can envision why that would be the case of when you'd know it. So when you know the propensity score is a good example is in a randomized experiment, right? If I just coin flip amongst all of you, I know that the propensity score 0.5 for everyone. Um, if even if I there's more complicated settings, right? So we could do something that was 
we have a coin flip, but it's gender weighted. So for men, we did one probability for women. We did another, that would be a propensity score, right? It would have an XI in it. Um, and it would be the truth. We would know the underlying weighted thing. And so stratify, this is coming back to this design based setting is that there are settings in which we know there's going to be reweightings that we want, um, to put over this population. So even that, in, remember going back to that inverse propensity score weighting, that's what you need to adjust for if what you're going for is this overall average treatment um, probability, average treatment effect, because if you reweight different ways within the sample, be it either on covariates or on clustered assignment based on geography or other things, to get a true reflection of the underlying um, distribution, you need to reweight accordingly. Now, Estimating it is much more common if you're thinking about this in the context of a non-randomized experiment, right? So observational data is the most obvious case. Um, and that's what uh, Rosenbaum and Rubin had in mind. And what we're gonna talk about and when you do in the homework is so, you know, this is a linear, this is, this is a binary variable, right? Between zero and one. So it's a limited dependent variable pretty canonical way that most folks estimate this is, for example, using like a logit model. Um, but really what you want is something that's flexible, right? In the limit, what you'd like is pi of X is some function, right? That we don't know. We wanna estimate that ideally in a flexible way that converges to the truth in the limit. So the idea being that we would flexibly allow for interactions and controls and that we would somehow like approximate that function as best we can. This is kind of challenging because there's, you know, in the limit is a meaningless statement for an empiricist. But what you want to do is think about the idea that what we're trying to do is flexibly estimate this um, in a way that is going to converge to the truth in the limit. This has gotten a lot better in recent times. So when a lot of this literature was written that I'm referring to in here, kind of machine learning techniques and more generally thinking about lasso is just like was not a thing that folks were using. Now, you know, there's starting to be more and more on this because we can kind of think of it, it's a prediction problem, right? We need to predict who's treated given a, a set of covariates. That's exactly what machine learning is very good at. Um, and we'll try and touch on that at the end of the course when we when we talk about machine learning methods. Um, one really kind of, well, two points. One is that you know, a linear model of pi, I wrote inherently be wrong. That's not quite right. But what I mean by that is, you know, if you're thinking about pi and then you wanted to estimate that out of sample, for those of you who are kind of familiar, these linear probability models, right, they don't inherently take it account of the fact that this stuff is, is um, bounded between zero and one. And so you can vary, you can get the wrong number, for example, and you can extrapolate the wrong way. That being said, it is a linear model is typically the best linear predictor. And that's, for example, what you use when you do OLS or not OLS, excuse me, two stage least squares. Um, so we'll revisit this, but you know, a lot of times when people are estimating these, they'll use a logit model and you'll kind of flexibly estimate with a sieve or with some kind of like higher order polynomials. Any questions about that? I'm, I'm throwing a lot of words at that. If you haven't seen this before, that may be confusing. Okay. Um, one kind of, I think, pretty fascinating result, especially if you're interested in the econometrics of this, comes from um, this paper by Imbens, Hirano, and Ritter. This is buried in a, this is, this paper sits in a literature that <clears throat> more generally is about, um, something called empirical likelihood, but I'm just going to give you the intuition about it. And the result is that even if you know pi, the true propensity score, it's better to use the estimated propensity score than not. So imagine you're running an experiment. You know what the estimated, you run, a, right? We randomly flip the coin. We know what the propensity score is given covariates. Well, what and so imagine that imagine it's just a true random coin flip, right? So we don't condition on any of one in the classes covariates. We still don't necessarily have perfect randomization, right? We get a draw. We saw with those coin flips, we could have gotten it that 40% of the sample is random is treated and 60% is not. What this paper basically shows is that actually these deviations from the true propensity score are informative 
when thinking about the estimation of the treatment. So if you think about this, this right, so we have this true estimate here, which you can think of as the number treated over the total sample, and then minus the true propensity score. Well, that's like a moment restriction, right, in GMM. So if we think about GMM here, additional moment restrictions can be valuable if there's cross covariances between the estimation of the different moments. So this is like an over-identifying restriction. And so the point of this paper is to basically highlight that actually you want to use the estimated propensity score to do this, this in when doing the inverse pro um, probability weighting estimator. So what's the punchline for this fact is when you do this, the Horvitz Thompson estimator, you actually, even if you knew what pi was, you want to use pi hat. So, right, like, so that makes sense. It's basically all I'm saying is I did a random experiment with a coin flip. Don't divide by 0.5 for the treated group, right? Actually use how many are treated and how many are not. And that will give you a, um, a more efficient estimator of what's going on. Any questions on that? It's kind of a, it's kind of a mind blowing result. I would say that research in the propensity score space has kind of died down, but it's it's amazing if you look at the papers that are in this space, the 90s and the 2000s was like a boom era for propensity scores. It's just like every econometrics paper is about propensity scores, it feels like. Um, and now it's like not an, a topic of interest. Um, okay. So now we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we are gonna contrast thinking about propensity scores with regression. So I'm gonna to be totally honest here. I mainly use regression. I rarely use propensity scores. I'm The reason why I'm advocating right now while we do this class is that propensity scores are almost more than a tool to in terms of doing estimation. They're an extremely valuable device for in, thinking intuitively about what's going on when you think about your design. But what we're going to do now is kind of talk about what is the difference between running a regression versus doing a p-score method. So some sort of matching like the inverse propensity score weighting, for example. So say we have run this regression. Um, so yi on um, a di, which is our treatment variable, and then we put in some controls, x1 and x2. So that's pretty standard, right? So we have some controls that we're worried about, and then we want to estimate what is the effect of di. Well, let's do two things. First, let's think about this in the context of the Aaron Allen Miller example that we were doing. So what Aaron Allen Miller, this is from their textbook, um, they highlight the following fact. What you're doing when you think about this model, this linear model here, right? This is, a, this is you postulating what the conditional expectation function is, right? So what we want when we do, for example, our tau estimate before, right? We, when we did the randomized experiment, the idea was, look, we need to know what the expectation of Y1 is and the expectation of Y2 is, or not Y2, sorry, Y1 and Y0, right? We need the, the treated mean and the control mean. And that's, we needed basically a, an estimate for, oops, this, and this. Well, once we write down that regression model, we are stipulating a particular functional form for that, for that model, right? We're saying, okay, well, turn DI off. So that's Y0. And we'll say we have, you know, say that this is the true models. Then the expectation of this is whatever the value is conditional on Xi and X2. So that's you're plugging in for X1 and X2. Here we have the values. And then we have some estimated coefficients. So we run this regression, then we get estimated coefficients and we plug in. And so we would just get imputed values in each case. And then we would take the difference. So conceptually, this is how Aaron Allen Miller really emphasized it. But in this setting, the way to think about what's going on is that, you know, we would say di is orthogonal to ui, conditional on these variables. They're in, it's independent. Well, really, what 
we're doing is we're approximating what the expectation function is. We're using linear regression as a way to impute missing values, which if you remember, that's kind of, that's the whole deal. That's what we're doing all this time. When we're thinking about estimating these treatment effects, we're trying to impute counterfactuals. And so here we're using the conditional expectation function to do that. And this is just another way. Remember when we did it the other time, when we did matching, we just said, let's find something close. Um, and so actually we can even compare, right? So what is it when we think about that um, propensity score example, remember we, what we were doing was we were matching one and two together. And so one and two got matched together. Well, what's the difference there? Well, one has an XI one equal to one and the other one has XI one equal to zero. So they're matched on seven and then they have a one difference here. And what we're doing is we're linearly extrapolating. I think that's pretty cool. I mean, that's like a really useful way of reframing the problem. We've basically imputed using these different values and we're, um, we're using the best linear predictor, which is OLS to fit this. Again, what's kind of neat about this, right? Is that, well, now we start to be like, okay, well, could we do better? How else would we want to approximate this? How do we think about the limitations of data and fitting this data? One could imagine fitting a different model in one setting versus another to impute better, right? You could allow for a different linear function for the treated versus the untreated. For that, you just do an interaction with the Xs, et cetera. I mean, there are, there are numerous ways to think about doing this. The, the key point is that we've kind of kept this in the context of we're thinking about the filling in missing data, and then we're gonna take average differences depending on what we're interested in. So when will this do well? Well, if our expectation function that we're approximating to be linear is linear, then, then we're in great shape, right? Like that's awesome. I mean, that's unlikely, but it's, it's great. If we don't have to extrapolate too much, that's also really good, right? So the, when you really have to extrapolate far, so remember what we said here was, well, the seven, all we had to do was just kind of change one value that's a pretty close approximation. We've exploited the idea that it's smooth across this covariate, that that will do well. And really the point is in the end is people like OLS because it's, it's the best linear predictor, right? It's kind of minimizes mean squared error. We should probably take advantage of that in a lot of settings. The really the key point in the end that I'm trying to emphasize um, in this is that this is just another way of inferring missing data we we, including myself in my, my, in my work, I lean on regression heavily, but the point is to say that, look, this, let's not forget, this is just another way of inferring what's going on in terms of missing data. Now, there's a huge amount of debate in terms of what approach is best. Um, you know, I, we're going to talk about this in just a second. The, I think the only real key takeaway is if you're thinking about this, when you want to do this with a matching setting, you know, using this estimated p-score is efficient in kind of a semi-parametric sense. Um, but obviously in finite samples, it will really vary depending on the setting. Okay. And then let's talk about um, Angris and Pischke's case for regression. Um, another great, they're really good at kind of um, alighting. I mean, it's basically the point is, is that and I'm going to read what they say, but it's not obvious that there's a perfect answer. We have a lot of reasons that we stick to regression in econ because A, basic familiarity with it, B, it fits with a lot of models. But damned if Angus and Pischke don't like make a good way of like make a compelling case. So what do they say? They say, we believe regression should be the starting point for most empirical projects. This is not a theorem. Undoubtedly, there are circumstances when propensity score matching provides more reliable estimates of average causal effects. The reason we don't find ourselves in the P-score wagon is practical. There's many details to be filled in when implementing the P-score matching, how to model the score and how to do inference. So we talked about that. These details aren't standardized, right? It's not like OLS where you're like, everybody knows how to do OLS and everyone knows how to type comma robust or robust equals true in their, in their code. Um, becomes a little more challenging to think about these, these um, broader cases as things get more complicated. Different researchers might therefore reach different, very different conclusions, even when using the same data and covariates. Moreover, as we've seen with the Horvitz-Thompson estimands, there's not much theoretical daylight between regression and P-score weighting. So 
what I, um, I think this is a point worth highlighting. Um, I didn't put the code in here to kind of, or the, the algebra here, just for the purposes of not making it too algebra heavy. But if you go to, um, in Mostly Harmless, when they talk about this, it, it's very nice. You know, the point about that, what they're saying here about the Horvitz Thompson estimator, the IPW estimator um, and covariates is that this stuff gets really straightforward when stuff is discrete, right? So when we go back to this setting, say XI was discrete. So, you know, say it was states and years, right? So these are variables that we can, I guess states is a bad example because there'll be many of them and you have to put in dummies. So let's just have it be, uh, a uh, gender and like a black white dummy. In those cases, those are discrete variables and you can fully saturate the model. So the, if you haven't heard this expression before to fully saturate the model means like I have a variable, say it's uh, values one, two, three, four, and five. Well, if I put dummies in for two, three, four, and five and I have a constant, what I've done is I fully saturated for every potential value. I'm estimating the mean at every point. And so I'll, I'll non-parametrically estimate what something looks like. So what that means though, right, is we'll exactly get the conditional expectation function right, right? So there's no mistake. Does that, I want people to make sure that they understand that because this is kind of the amazing result of um, regression with dummy variables is when you do, where's my black? Say you have a, a that, something like this. Here's some outcome we're interested in. And here's this thing, which has five values. So we could do a linear model, which just fits some linear line like this. If you put dummies in for XI, if it's discrete and you can do this, well, what happens is, is that then you just end up calculating the mean value at every point, right? So it's a fully saturated model and it may not be perfectly linear or it may be linear, who knows? The point is, is that sorry, this is a Paul. parametric model. Can you guys, sorry, you guys camera, probably can't. Camera. Yeah, you can't see the, it's too small. Oh yeah, we'll switch the camera. Thanks, Sam. We'll switch it so you can see it more clearly. So, okay, let me make a little brighter here. So, The point is to say that when you dummy out for these things, this is a fully saturated model. What happens is that the linear model, excuse me, the OLS model becomes exactly the conditional expectation function. So this is just for a bivariate setting, right? Where I have one variable. You can do this in multivariate though as well, right? So I could have had XI. And then what I also have is that XI and say another variable, which is a dummy variable. Let's say WI which is zero one. Well, now I have another variable, which previously what I would have done is I would have said, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll like allow for an interaction. So it's allow for an interaction. I'll have like a different slope if it was a linear model, or if you fully saturate it, then what you'd say is, okay, I'll have a point here. I'll have a point here, et cetera. And so now I have 10 things that I need to estimate as opposed to three. Anyway, as this become, when you have discrete variables, the point is, is that you can fully saturate the model and the best linear predictor, which is usually indicated. Can you guys, can you guys see that green? Is that readable for you guys? Okay, good. So this is called, usually when you put this expectation with the star, that's for the OLS version of it, the best linear predictor version of it, of E of Y conditional on X. When you fully saturate it, it's equal to the conditional expectation function. And the point is, is that then this is as if you were doing matching, matching within bins, right? We've now no longer have to think about anything complicated with p-scores or anything else. We have bins, we can bin them, we take the average within that, and then we wait over the probabilities. There's nothing complicated that goes on. Um, so to bring this back to um, Josh and, and Jorn's point is that uh, Angers and Pischke basically are arguing, well, look, in the discrete case, when there's, um, we can just dummy everything out, 
it's as if you were doing regression. They're like one to one. So there's not that much daylight. But they're basically doing the same thing. It's, I mean, that's more or less what they're saying. And then there's some weighting differences that matter for IV. Um, so I would say that their punchline is that stuff is complicated in Peace Corps. You have, there are more pieces you have to worry about. It's less standardized, especially in economics. And as a consequence, um, it's a little bit, you know, confusing to do Peace score as the starting point for when you're analyzing data. There may be reasons that later you want to do it, um, but their view is that you can do most of this exercise in regression setting. Um, I have to say, just because I got sort of trained in this setting, I kind of agree. Um, it, I think the key thing here is that if you are interested in using these approaches, it's just to remember that these are all different ways of doing the same exercise. What regression eventually will let you do is put down, if you want to do a more model-based approach of this, you can plug in, you'll have a structural model of what's going on, and then a propensity score can be more challenging to think about. But in a design-based setting, this is they're kind of just trying to do the same exercise. They're trying to fill in for missing data. Um, what is really useful about P-score is that intuitively, it's going to force us to think about the overlap of covariates and how balanced things are. And this is what we're going to talk about before, but really it's the idea of how comparable are treated and untreated groups. When we run a regression and we have a lot of X variables that we're controlling for, it's challenging for us to um, say how much comparability, I mean, we can take the means within a group, but there's this high dimensional vector of X's that it's challenging to compare between one or the other. Maybe the, some of the means are similar, some of them are not. How do you know how important it is? Well, when you think about it in a propensity score setting, it's very concrete what it means, right? If there's overlap versus not overlap, you'll kind of have a sense, you know, theoretically that the P-score reflects exactly kind of how balanced those covariates are within any particular category. Any questions on that? What we're gonna talk about now is a version of this where, so this is an empirical context, Anthony, where um, this famous paper by Lalonde in 1986, is it 86 or, I think it's 86, um, where he was analyzing a randomized work study intervention um, the NSW, the, the National Support for Work Demonstration. Um, National Supported Work Demonstration. I don't know why there's no D in NSW, but it's referred to as the NSW. Um, basically what it was, it was a temporary employment program where um, individuals who you might envision um, struggle to get work or struggle to get high paying work. Um, maybe it was because they're former felons or they're on... Um, subsidies um, for food and tax credits, that it was a way to basically give them work experience that was temporary, that would pay them, not that much, but pay them such that they could then transition into higher, into um, higher paying work. The, Lon's original paper is kind of an amazing study in, and I want you all to remember the context for this. This is three years after, let's take the con out of econometrics, right? So this is the world in which, uh, Lalonde is really responding directly to this of saying, hey, if you don't have experimental data, you can get it really wrong. What he shows is that you take this experiment, you use this, the treatment and control groups from NSW, and then instead of using the control group, you use the PS, PSID, which is this um, panel survey of income dynamics, which is a random sample of individuals in the United States, and we use them as the control group instead. That in a number of ways, you're going to get it wrong. So he, he does a vast, you know, large number of different things, different specification checks, et cetera. But it's exactly that, like, you know, there are things that are different in unobservable and somewhat observable ways between the NSW sample and the PSID sample. And so if you just compare the two, you're going to get estimates that are really wrong. So the point is, is that within the randomized sample, the program has this really strong positive benefit on real earnings. It's actually quite remarkable. Um, but when you compare it to the PSID sample, well, you've already, the treatment sample is already kind of negatively selected in a lot of ways, right? It's the types of individuals who were already struggling in the, in the labor market. And so comparing those two, you can get a, either a negative sign, or if you select in different ways, you can kind of move this, the, the sample all around. Basically, the point is that the covariants are not balanced within the treatment and control. Um, 
So, you know, what does he say? I say, that's bad. Um, this comparison shows that many econometric procedures do not replicate the experimentally determined results. So that's the punchline from Lalonde. It's kind of this amazing result. Um, this is very famous. This is actually two papers by uh, Rahiv De Dehagia and Waba, who reanalyze this data set using propensity score methods. So there's two papers, one in JASA, one in Restat. They're very nice papers and are worth reading. Um, their point in the paper is that um, using new P scores basically gives you two things. So they, they're, they're advocating for propensity score methods for doing this. And they kind of doing it for two reasons. One is that they're arguing you can actually do a reasonably good job. So this is, I think this is the thing that is overemphasized about this paper is saying, hey, if we hadn't used regression and we had just used P-scores, we would have gotten it right. That's one takeaway from it. And it's true that they can get actually relatively close to the experimental estimates from this by matching with the PSID. But I think the thing that they show that is more important is that it actually provides, provides a really useful way of identifying kind of diagnostics about the matching, about kind of, well, if I take the PSID and I take the um, NSW sample, that the P-scores just look kind of very different between one group versus another. Like these, you have to kind of be very aware of what the samples look like. It's a way of kind of understanding the, the differences and what, you, what subgroups can you analyze versus what subgroups can you not analyze. One point that they make in the paper is that you really need to subsample the data in order to be able to match well. So they make this point that in the NSW data set that not all of them can you observe all of the pre-employment history. So they didn't calc they didn't weren't able to estimate all of the pre-employment history for this sample. This is basically, you know, this happened in the 1970s. For some of the data, they only had it for one of the years, the pre-employment data. And their point is, look, you actually really need to know what happened beforehand because the trend in your employment and your earnings to match on that is really important for getting a good estimate using P-score methods. So I don't know how many of you are labor economists, but hopefully like the term, um, the Ashenfelter dip is potentially something you've heard before. This is this idea of, well, what you, what you need to worry about is the types of people who are in these programs they're ones potentially who had labor market disruptions. And so they have big changes in their employment trajectory. And so to find good matches for them, we need to be able to track that path so that we can then match them correctly in the data set. And so, you know, there's two points of this Dehagian Waba paper. One is to say, look, you can actually do a pretty good job. But two is also to say these P score methods give you a good sense of who can you potentially sample on, who can you not. Um, then, this is just a back and forth, um, Smith and Todd come back in the Journal of Econometrics in 2005 and say, well, actually, and then they have X, Y, and Z. It's very much a, like, here are the issues with the Haitian Waba. The main point that I would say, and you're getting my perspective on this, is that it's really the subsampling that matters a lot for this. You know, the, this ability to... Um, subsample to look at the two years before is predisposing you to be able to analyze this. And if you don't match on those, like you can't really do a very good job. And that would, that's basically Dehagia's response in the 2000, he has a response article in that issue. And he basically says, yes, of course. So I, in the sense saying that, um, and this is going to come back to how do we want to think about the economics of this versus the program evaluation of this, this is basically a quote from Dehagia, a judgment-free method for dealing with problems of sample selection bias is the holy grail of the evaluation literature. But this search reflects more the aspirations of researcher rather than any plausible reality. In practice, the best one can hope for is a method that works in an identifiable set of circumstances and self-diagnostic in the sense that it raises a red flag if it's not functioning well. Propensity remark, pro, ugh, Propensity score methods are applicable when selection is based on observables that are observed. In the context of training programs, this followed a suggestion from the training program literature, which suggests that two or more years of pre-treatment earnings are necessary. So this is Ashton Filter Dip. In terms of self-diagnosis, the method and the associated sensitivity checks successfully identify the context in which it succeeds and which it does not, at least for the NSW data. It doesn't provide a silver bullet, a black box technique, 
in which you can estimate the treatment effect under all circumstances, neither developed as a technique nor Dehesi and Waba have claimed otherwise. Otherwise, however, with input and judgment from the researcher, it can be a useful and powerful tool. So this is a little bit also, I think what's funny about this, you can almost think of this paragraph as a response to this Angus and Pischke paragraph I showed you before, right? Which is, yes, it's nice to have things that are just plug and chug, right? So I think um, Angus and Pischke are saying, hey, we want something where you just instate and you're typing reg Y on X and everybody does the same thing. And Dehesi and Waba are saying, well, maybe we should expect from our researchers like the ability to think carefully and do stuff on their own. Um, I would say that a similar kind of analogy is done when thinking about machine learning techniques now versus um, doing something with regression. You know, machine learning, it's like, there's all this off the shelf stuff you have to tweak and worry and think about. And some people view that as a bug and some people view that as a feature. And this is kind of a debate on, on how you wanna do this well and be transparent about what you're doing. Um, any questions so far? So this gets a little bit to Anthony's question about um, what is the problem? I, I mean, problem is the wrong word, but it's more, you know, we've been emphasizing this in here for uh, the setting, you know, we the randomized experiment is kind of the ideal. And then we have this, um, we're trying to do stuff with observable. It's nice because we can check our work. Well, the problem with these methods, right, is that we've initially motivated strong ignorability under settings with random assignment or something that's approximating it. But in a lot of settings, you don't have that. You're just using observational data and then you're going to use p-score or regression to estimate a causal effect. Kind of this is a great line from this Heckman, Todd, and Ichimura paper about propensity scores. This is their 2004 restud, which I think is amazing, which is ironically missing data give rise to the problem of causal inference but missing data, i.e. the unobservables producing variation in D, conditional on X, are also required to solve the problem of missing, of causal inference, right? So in other words, we need variation in D, but we don't know what's causing it because we've conditioned on all the things we can think of that are potential confounders when we do this. So in other words, if we're controlling for X, what's, what's moving What's moving D? So this is a typo. This should be, if this should be an additional source of variation in D that we're not capturing, right? So if we wrote down a regression, right? It would say, well, there's a UI or something that we don't know what, whatever UI is. So let's think about that for a second. So just think about why, why does that have to be the case that there's an additional source of variation, right? If, if X perfectly predicted D, why would that be a problem? So this is an example that comes from actually their mastering metrics from Angerson Piskri's other book that one of my friends um, showed me, which is think about D as being some sort of medical treatment that we're interested in, where it's selected by a doctor or a nurse or, or some medical practitioner. And why is the subsequent health outcome? So we wanna know what's the effect of D on Y. Well, if D is perfectly predictable, say there's always a rule that a doctor uses to predict it, right? It's the age of the patient, the doctor's background, we could pr perfectly predict D with no error. If we know X, we know D. Well, can we identify the effect of D on Y? Well, it turns out the answer is no, right? And it's like, anyone who does regression, probably you know, notice this, right? So the second example here is if you ran a regression where you did Y and DI and X, X and DI would be perfectly collinear. You'd never be able to identify D, right? It also, the other point is that it fails strong ignorability, right? We don't have this aspect to which there's variation in DI given X. So we need quote unquote exogenous variation in DI. We need some sort of random noise moving around our variable of interest. Um, you know, wanted quote unquote exogenous variation. This is like graduate school for most people. I want exogenous variation in something. And a structural econometrician would say something like, look, the variation in D is driven by two pieces. There's X, which is these terms that we were talking about, which are potentially confounders or endogenous. And there's some V. But what is V? And then much of the time, we don't know what V is. And so this comes back to this point about research design. And I think, um, you know, I got a lot of, I, I post our 
our lecture notes online. And so then I post them on Twitter for all the econometricians. Everyone is very bored during COVID. And so lots of econometricians are arguing online now. And so many, you know, this idea of research design, this, kind of, this is kind of debatable, but this is coming back to kind of this point about when we were thinking about something designing variation in D, this is where it comes from, right? It's like, we have this V, we think it's driving this, but if we don't know what V is, how do we make a, po a positive case for what is affecting us versus affecting our treatment versus not? Um, another way of putting this, and I think this is kind of the more worrying way of saying this, is that if two units are observationally identical, but they choose different outcomes, well, you know, there might be, I use kind of two ways you can think it. You'd be like, oh, well, I just got lucky. You know, there's just like, there's a bunch of random noise in it. And it's like, one day it was raining, one day it wasn't, and it didn't matter. Or you're like, wow, there must have been something really different about those two people. And they sorted, that's, that's a story of adverse selection, right? When you write down a model and does this, there's huge sorting that happens um, across this in some types of um, adverse selection um, and information asymmetry settings. So... Just what's really nice about this, and this is what I think is really valuable about P-scores above and beyond these methods for estimating treatment effects, is that we can start to think about the treatment and control group in this distribution of P-scores, right? So consider this P-score distribution, there's two P-score distributions here, right? So we have pi of X, and in our setting here, there's a lot of overlap, right? So if there's, um, I just randomly generated this data, but you know, the, the green line is the treatment group, the red line is the control group, if we wanted to estimate the treatment effect in this setting, what we take our data for these different people and we re reweight as a function of where they show up in this distribution to get the overall average, right? This would be, it is what it is. There's lots of places here where what we're doing is, you know, both groups show up. So you take the, you know, the middle around 0.6, there's lots of treated, lots of control. It seems reasonable that maybe it was kind of coin flips. Maybe it's just random, who does it? But once you start comparing the people who are down in the less, the propensity score below 0.5, there's not that many treatment people who are there. And there's a lot of control people who are there. And you start to say, well, what's different about these, these, these treatment individuals relative to the control? And why did these people pick in versus the others? Not, you know, it's not always going to be quite so no normally distributed. But the idea is really, who am I selecting on these people in some way that makes them not comparable? The, the strong ignorability condition is saying that, well, conditional on this P-score, these are a comparable group of individuals, but am I picking on some other unobservable that makes them less um, comparable? So what I'm gonna kind of wrap up on on this end part here is thinking about, this is, um, this is kind of a, a structural model of the way that um, Jim Heckman and Heckman's many co-authors um, have proposed to think about this. Um, this is from Heckman's 1997 uh, JHR paper, where what he's thinking about is um, a structural model of outcomes here. And so what you could think of is this outcome, you know, the potential outcome when treatment is off versus on. Well, there's some G function which, you know, when the treatment is off and is equal to some value given covariates X and some, uh, and whether or not you have the treatment. So the D and X are inputs and then some error terms depending on whether or not I got the treatment. And so then I can use the kind of the Rubin model to plug in and it's, well, the outcome then is this base thing plus DI times this term plus this error term, right? So Hopefully this is obvious where this comes from, right? What I've just done, I've gone from the potential outcomes world to the what you would observe in the data. And so what it's saying is, well, for a given person, they have some base outcome and then there's DI. And if they turn DI on, they get two things. One is this kind of conditional on XI, what the population gets. The population of people with values XI, they go up by this difference in G. And then there's the idiosyncratic gain, right? And then there's some base characteristic. So now we start thinking about what drives the economic decision-making for DI. So if we wanted to talk about a model where things are, people are really selecting based on their own self-interest, well, then what will happen is that the people who will be choosing into the program are the people who have high, high value, both from a population perspective and idiosyncratic perspective, right? So this is, imagine there's a program that opens 
right? Some of, for some of you, this program is a great program to be in. For some of you, you don't care as much. And as a consequence, it's going to create variation in who takes it. But that's obviously highly endogenous. And as a consequence, if you just ran an OLS regression, you might get something wrong. This creates correlation between the potential outcomes and the DI. Now, what are the settings in which controlling or conditioning on variables works? Well, so constant effects um, would work. So this should be UI1 minus UI0 uh, zero equals zero for everyone. So it's just the idea that everybody gets the same effect conditional on XI, right? So then you don't have to worry about selection because conditioning on XI will be sufficient. Or everybody within this XI expects kind of to get the same outcome. And so maybe you don't, you don't know, you don't have an expectation about you yourself. You don't know anything. I think a lot of times that's what people cater to, right? Is you say to the idea of, well, I don't know that much about what's going in. So some people randomly go in, some people don't. It's just a function of how they're feeling that day. Sorry, I should have, I'm, I should have explained a little bit more this DI selection. This is basically saying this YI1 minus YI0, that's just, you know, the difference in your outcomes, right? So how well are you better off in this? Some kappa, which is like a scaling feature, which makes it, it's like, think of this as the cost of taking up the program. And then you have some idiosyncratic term. So it just creates random noise in what you get. It. It's this, this is how are you feeling when you woke up that day kind of thing. So what that'll do is that VI is a random variable distribution. Say you made it a logit distribution, a logistic distribution that would turn this into kind of like a logit probability, right? So, what does this mean? Well, if we think about it this way, then the P score, right, is just generated by that var that variable distribution. It's the the difference in the population gain plus the difference in the idiosyncratic gain plus some kappa term greater than some random variable VI. That's a P score function. If we, like I said, if we made it a logistic one, we'd know exactly what the functional form is. But more generally, this lets us talk about what the distribution of the p-score is this gives us a, a probability score function and we can condition on xi um the 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 reason i think this is useful and i i'm i hope you all do as well is that well this gives us a framework for mapping the p-score into thinking about the economic gains of someone taking up a program or endogenously choosing di right so what are the reasons why someone would want to take the program so um you know, people take the program because it's personally valuable for them. Well, then if we want to induce them to take the program, well, sometimes you just have to force everyone to do it. How do we, you know, say some of you have taken up the program, some of you are not. It's because personally, the ones who didn't take it, you, it wasn't worth it for you personally. Well, how do I get you to take it? Well, I could make it so you have to take it. That's not always something you can do. It could give you a really large incentive to do it. That can be very expensive. The more and more that you don't want to do it, uh, the more and more expensive it can be. Um, or I could kind of up the benefit of it, but that selects then into a particular type of person. So I could make it so that, you know, certain types of people benefit more, but then you're going to be selecting in certain ways. So what's helpful about this is that thinking about the endogenous selection into the model forces you to think about, well, how do I induce variation in the people who take up the model, take up the program in the first place? Um, so think about it here in this setting. So now what I've done here is just really what I think is useful is to say, think of the propensity score as an index of how you value it. So these models, what I'm talking about now are sometimes called single index models for thinking about, um, say like the choice to take up a program or for doing program evaluation. The single index model, like say, for example, in like a Roy model. Um, so what we want is something that varies individuals' valuation of the program. So if we look at this graph on the right, who benefits from the treatment, right? So under that model we just stipulated, well, the people who are very likely to take it are the ones who had high personal value of taking it. Those are these people on the right. So they got a, these people on the right had a high, overall have a high value. And the ones who didn't take it in this blue, so the where, where the blue text is, think about what the our propensity score model says is, the ones who took the treatment here, they're the ones who had a high value for the program. So they have both a 
in terms of the X size, they have a high personal value and in terms of their idiosyncratic value. As a consequence, if you're a person whose propensity score, now say we had split this into treated and control. Well, if I find someone who's on the P score up here, but they're in the control group, the Roy model would suggest that, well, the reason they didn't take it is because they had a very strong personal reason, personal idiosyncratic reason to not take the treatment and vice versa on this, on the left side. So that's conceptually exactly the intuition um, that we had for thinking about a confounder. But what's really useful now is now we start to say, okay, well now what we wanna do is randomly shift people's propensity to take up this program. And so one way in this underlying model that we would do this is imagine that we just shifted kappa around. If we shift kappa, so for some people I make kappa equal to zero and some people I make kappa equal to whatever, 10. Then what I'm doing is I'm inducing more or less people to be in the program because what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna get people whose valuation have changed as a result of this. So what I'm doing is I'm, I, I'm basically moving around spaces in the propensity score function space where I'm getting, I'm integrating over that part of the space that I've managed to shift people or in. Um, that's basically what you do with IV. Um, if you want to put a model like this, uh, this is one way to think about what's going on in IV is that what you're getting is you're shifting one part of the distribution. You're shifting some set of the people to be in the program versus not. And that's who you're kind of capturing when you, when you shift the IV values, uh, excuse me, when you shift the propensity scores, you move who are the marginal people that are participating in the program. Any questions on that? Sorry, I know this is, I kind of put this together as a way of trying to describe it. And I know it's a lot. So does that make sense in terms of conceptually, the idea is to think about this. There are marginal people for whom they're taking on the program versus not. That's kind of the distribution of people that we think of when we're estimating this. There's some, if we, if we moved Kappa around, we would change kind of the marginal person who would be in the program because we've increased or decreased the cost. And so then as we move that a lot, then there's a distribution of folks who we're integrating over when we do this.